We brought together animal advocates from around the world to explore complex topics. Through respectful solution-based dialogue, we attempt to find common ground. Welcome to the first ever episode of Common Ground, a brand new series from the Animal Rights Show. I'm super excited by the potential of this new format to help us explore new advocacy ideas, as well as bring us together on some potentially controversial topics. In this first episode, we'll be exploring the language of animal rights, both from a rights-based perspective, as well as some creative ways in which we can dismantle the whole idea of human superiority. The goal here isn't to say anyone's doing the wrong thing, but to help support each other, to explore our language in new ways, and take our advocacy to the next level. With that, I hope you enjoy the first ever episode of Common Ground. As animal advocates, we all want to advance the plight of our fellow animals as fast as possible. We're super creative at trying new things to help build respect for them and their rights. However, what if one of the most accessible ways to do this was through our language, which sadly also seems to be one of the most overlooked elements of animal advocacy? How do you most commonly refer to quote, animals? It's kind of controversial now in the movement, isn't it, non-human animals, in the sense that it's uh, said to center uh, human beings. And, um, you know, so people moved away to other animals, usually from non-human animals. So that's an interesting one. Yeah, and uh, one option that isn't listed here that I've started to quite like using is our fellow animals. That's a really delicate balance, isn't it? Because we want to com um, make comparisons to human animals in some ways to help um, ex expand people's selective empathy. However, we also don't want to send the message that they have to be like humans to have moral value. Another thing I've, I've started to like doing is um, just defaulting to she, even if I don't know their gender. Academics throughout the, I'd say from, from the late 70s onwards, they, they started to do um, almost like put she as a default, as a kind of counterbalance to all those years where you know um man was was referred was a reference to humanity that kind of thing how do you most commonly refer to people who are not vegan probably easiest is non-vegan i i do like vegan curious and just simply someone who's not vegan um i have heard the term kind of pre-vegan chucked yeah, pre around yeah pre-vegan is quite good i think it's interesting. I, I think for me, that's more kind of th from a theoretical perspective than necessarily something I would use verbally. It's very useful on the street, though, because you're almost like going, oh, so you're, you're pre-vegan. You're, kind of, you're kind, of, kind of giving them the direction that they're on, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. It's, it's kind of, uh, it's almost a little bit jokey on the street in the sense, you know, oh, a pre-vegan, you know, that kind of thing. I'll just read through some of the messages I'm getting. It's not already vegan. Vegan ally, I see from Stefan. That's quite a good one. I think, I think we need to clarify the omnivore carnivore because I'm assuming people have gone for omnivore. Although I suppose with the popularity of, of carnism, maybe people would call non-vegans carnivores, but it obviously would be um, biologically inaccurate. I guess, it, yeah, it implies that our bio, uh, uh, biology, you know, that somehow when we go vegan, we're no longer omnivores when we are. So it's, it's, it, there's all kinds of subtle nuances, I think, to what we might be implying here. See, nobody went for corpse munching. Now, corpse munching used to be... <laughs> no, but that, that, that used to be very popular around about the turn of the century. Um, I th yeah, I think it was. Um, up until about 2010, I think that, that became very popular. It's a delicate balance, isn't it? Because I think a lot of these terms are quite humorous, but then also figuring out how to... Um, still remembering to advocate when we are talking to people who aren't vegan and, 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 and finding that balance. Because I do... I definitely see a lot in um, vegan circles, people just referring, referring to carnists almost as a slur. And I think it's going to be difficult to advocate to, on, on that, you know, framing. Oh, yeah. Well, I've always thought that uh, the reason that um, carnism has taken off in the movement, because um, essentially we talk about a vegetarian concept, but the uh, vegan movement seems to like it. And I think it does come over as a, a bit of a slur. Whereas obviously the actual academic uh, beginning of it was with Melanie Joy. And so... She regarded it as a sub, a sub ideology of speciesism. So it, it was a, a kind of vegetarian idea. It was never a kind of vegan idea, although it's claimed to be that. It's a bit complicated. How do you most commonly refer to animal use? Looks like animal exploitation, interestingly, has, has come out on top. 
Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's a, a, a kind of adequate word to describe their entire life. I would, I, I would say, you know, they're they're in an exploited position. You know, they're they're born born as exploited beings. They're born with a kind of death sentence on them already. Um, you know, I mean, like it's, uh, you know, to, to get more controversial, it, it is it is a very kind of enslavement kind of situation. Maybe we can do a quick overview of the ethno methodology behind it, which is basically the way people interpret the words, even though we may inter um, intend it to mean a certain way. Mm. I, I think one component and just one of the, of these things is. Um, looking at the dictionary definitions, which I appreciate can have speciesism and all kinds of other things entangled with them. However, I do think they are a, a point we should consider when we're choosing words. And I think it's quite interesting when we look at animal exploitation. I'll put the uh, definition in the chat right now. It refers to the action or fact of treating someone unfairly in order to benefit from their work. And then also the second alternative definition, which is probably less common, is the action of making use of or benefiting from a resource. Now, I appreciate when we're using these words, the person listening isn't necessarily thinking of these two points and then evaluating our message. Uh, you know, they're going to automatically think of other times they've heard exploitation in their life and then think from there. But for me, you know, I, I don't want to suggest that, you know, unfairly treating them for their work, I, we shouldn't be using them at all. And then also, I don't want to refer to them like they're a resource because I think one of the key claims as animal advocates is not referring to other animals as renewable resources. So what do you think, Roger? Is this a bit too detailed or do you think there's something to this? Well, when you refer to them as resources, you, you refer to them in terms of um, what culturally they are in the same sense as if we talk about um, animal companions as uh, items of property, that is kind of factually accurate. You know, so obviously we've got a critique of that, but it would be an accurate thing to say as, as a descriptor. Um, so, that, so does that one. I mean, have you ever been, I mean, you've done a lot of street work, uh, Jeremy, in the same way as we have in Dublin. And um, have, you, have you ever had somebody say you can't exploit other animals? Oh, I haven't had that one. But no, I, I think that's what I mean. I, yeah, I mean it's, not as though they're not, it's not as though they're not exploitable, you know. Yeah, and I guess I, I appreciate this is a pretty detailed textbook definition. It's just, to me, the underlying thing. I mean, I appreciate they are treated as resources, but they're also treated as it's in a way, some things versus someone. So I don't think we should refer to them as it's or, or something either, you know, so from that, from that extension, you know, should we really be using a term that could imply we're unfairly treating them for their work? And it also goes to the welfare discussion from last week, doesn't it? So obviously society views animals as objects um, wrongly and it's and some things. You can use objects. So you can use a car, you can use a chair, but you can't exploit objects. You can't exploit a car, you can't exploit tables and chairs, but you can exploit um, other animals. So to me, that kind of is a point in favour of animal exploitation over use. I definitely agree that they're both better than suffering, abuse, torture, cruelty, because they're very subjective and imply welfare. And uh, yeah, but uh, I, I am in camp exploitation. <laughs> camp exploitation, we're not camp here to buy people, but... <laughs> I think for me, it's any of these words aren't to be viewed in isolation. They're a, um, to, to me, I like to look at our language and our interactions, like we're um, painting a picture, you know, we've got the frame, but then we're not just doing one brush stroke. We're doing multiple brush strokes to overall complete the total package. So I would never focus and just say animal use. It's usually parlayed with, you know, using other animals and uh, violating their right to be respected and not bred, used, or killed. So it's very clear that I'm not just using use, because I agree use on its own could be used as quite neutral. To me, it's about establishing the scope as animal use, and then honing in and talking about rights violations and the breeding and the killing. Real quickly on the murder point. Um... <laughs> I'm interested in, the, in that bottom category. All these grovelers who, who use the word, who put rights violation in there. Who, who did that, eh? Who did that? <laughs> <laughs> I think they might know the, the, the spirit behind yeah. the animal rights here. Show here think, that we I actually think, want to talk about rights yeah. violations. Yeah, because that cause, in every now and then. Yeah, because nobody, <laughs> nobody put animal cruelty in there because they know they get jumped all over by me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting from an animal abuse perspective. We could talk, touch on that real briefly before we go to the next poll. But I think it's an interesting one because... I think with our language, we want, we want to have that jarring effect in the sense that we get people thinking about these issues. And the question is just those potential interpretations. And when we have a predominantly welfareist movement from both the top 
um, you know, from the organizational perspective, but also from the grassroots perspective, largely through our language, you know, to me, we want to remove as any potential implication that we could have, you know, use without abuse. One thing I'd like to ask everybody here a question about is the, um, the murder option, which nobody has ticked on. You know, like mm. we've, all, we've all seen the badges. In fact, uh, VIP, um, we, sell, we sell meet his murder badges. And, uh, you know, some people kind of object to that, the word murder. Well, that, that's an interesting one for me because in 2018, I did a, a language video where I suggested not using it because it could have a derailing effect. And I think I've come around on that a little bit because I think for longer conversations or perhaps when we know the person, if, we, if we're confident that we could have a, a conversation with them about dismantling speciesism and why, you know, other animals are just as um, capable of being murdered as other humans... I think that could be a pretty powerful way to go about things. It's just those, like you said, Roger, when we're on the street or maybe even on social media, having like a, a quick exchange and then the person goes on their way. I think it's going to be difficult to pack that all into a short exchange. But I think there, there is some merit to those longer interactions. I think a really un, uh, unique strategy, I think, if we do want to use that language is to ask people, you know, what would we call this if we were doing this to other humans is, a, is quite a, a, a clever way to bring those words in without introducing them ourselves and then leave it to the listener to decide if it's an appropriate description. And oftentimes they will say, you know, murder or enslavement or some of those things. Non-vegans, they're going to think that, you know, use is absolutely fine it's absolutely normal and it's quite okay so i think then use has to be sort of like transformed into more of an abuse sort of thing so i think it really depends on your audience you know there are sort of people that are using animals slash abusing them because they don't really understand and then there is the people that are sort of like you know they've got you know we're better than animals and it's really can the the whole world view is contingent on being better than other animals. So I think, you know, human supremacist is really sort of like important for that. I think, you know, using words like the animal death industry and um, animal abusers, in some contexts, it might be quite helpful. So you could sort of, you know, soften it up a bit, I think, without saying you are an animal murderer. Yeah, it's interesting. I've seen an interesting reaction to the, the murder side of things. And watching um, uh, chats on online, that people use it in a, in a way that's not necessarily targeted at the person, but the person takes it that way and says, are you calling me a murderer? And then I think it, for some people that may have the jarring effect necessary to get them to think about it, but it's in specifically the context we're describing with um, uh, uh, you know, farmers. Um, I might say animal users would be another option. Um, I'm just not sure they're the low-hanging fruit. To me, that's kind of like going out and advocating the vivisectors. Sarah has said something interesting in the chat. Uh, Non-vegans can misinterpret abuse, as in taking backyard hens as eggs isn't abuse, and the focus then tends to head towards welfare rather than rights. Um, yeah, I suppose sometimes when you say abuse, people will tend to jump to, um, oh, I'm not an animal abuser, you know, because they take care of their dogs really well or... They say, you know, they only get free range eggs, you know, not knowing um, the problems that come with that. So I think sometimes using use can be uh, like avoid using the word abuse because people have their own understandings of what levels of use are OK. Um, and yeah, the conversation can kind of go welfare, I think, um, without maybe you even realizing it has because, you are you know, you've just different understandings than the person you're talking to. Um, so, yeah, personally, I tend to avoid that word. Um, when talking to people. What about Pam Pamela, would you say that then if you did use abuse as the dominant kind of word, would that would that kind of focus it towards welfare, do you think, or can you avoid that? No, but I think that's why, exactly why it's important to use the word use. But again, it depends on the context. And as Sarah said, you know, like a lot of non-vegans wouldn't understand the whole sort of like, they would, exactly as Sarah said, you know, they think that abuse means like, you know, you kick your dog or whatever. They wouldn't think it means that you sort of, you know, eat free range, you know, milk or cows or whatever, you know. Yeah. So I think that's really important. So that's what I mean about the context in a vegan context, in sort of like an advocacy context specifically, I'd be trying to use the word use. <laughs> Because this is what we're trying to eradicate. But in a non-vegan context, I'd either be using use slash abuse, you know, in t using the, the same, you know, call, saying use 
and then sometimes saying abuse. So it gets through into their heads that they understand that use is abuse, or maybe even just saying that. It's kind of quite interesting to use the, the stronger terms again, depending on who you're talking to and the context. Yeah. The way I use uh, use is to frame it in the way that Pamela kind of suggested. Uh, because we are kind of in the context of advocacy, but also we're talking about in the context of a deeply speciesist um, society. And so I always use use to explain the difference between animal rights and animal welfare. You know? And then I'm fine then to talk about abuse if that's the kind of language they want to use. But um, mm -hmm. if it goes too far, I then remind them of the fact that, well, actually, our position is, 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 a, is about ending use. And that's the point. It's not we're talking about use, we're talking about ending use. That's the key to it. Uh, so Greg says slash asks, I hate the way, I hate the way euthanize is being used now to describe killing farmed animals now that processing plants are closing. Is this a term coming up? And, 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 and that's, that's a really critical part of the puzzle to me is it's not just the words we choose to use, but it's also the words that are used against us, especially by those who profit from animal use. So when they say things like this, I think it's really good to look for opportunities to challenge them on this and, mm. and say, actually, well, by euthanize, you know, we're not doing this in the same context. Yeah, I mean, somebody's mentioned in the chat the word cull, and I always change the word cull to kill um, because, you know, culls just seems to be one of those, you know, hide the reality words that, that are often used. Again, you know, the thing that I often talk about it um, in relation to Ireland is that they call the slaughterhouses factories. And I know, I know that in other places they call them plants and they, they do all kinds of things to, you know, because, I mean, the slaughterhouse, it's an interesting word, you know, house of slaughter, really fascinating kind of word. I mean, that's, that's their business, you know, what did you do all day, daddy kind of thing. And, um, you know, so to, to then call it a factory or a plant is to, is to kind of hide the reality of it. How do you most commonly answer if someone asks if you're vegan? I think those day-to-day -day interactions is a real pivotal way that we can look for ways to build awareness and not, we don't necessarily have to set up a, a street demo or do something specific. Um, the topic that's come up in the past is around veganism in general. Is it perhaps um, a bit human centric and really bringing things back to the animals? And that's to me where questions like this are an opportunity to say why we're vegan and not just like I am a vegan, but actually what that philosophy represents and what we're, um, you know, boycotting essentially and, um, and also campaigning against. So, you know, one thing I like to say is, um, you know, if someone says I'm vegan is, yes, I'm vegan because I don't want to support animal use or, you know, others' rights being violated um, and specifically the right to be respected, you know, not bred, used and killed and any variation of those things. What do you say, Roger, if someone asks if you're vegan? I might say uh, uh, yes, uh, and de depending, depending on what they, I feel they're getting at, you know, um, you know, oh, you're going you, to die in 10 minutes, you know, I, I might say, yes, I've been vegan for 41 years. You know, and, um, you know, I, I, be I believe that other animals have rights, you know, so I might, I might try to kind of like open up a vista of possibilities in terms of kind of conversation in, in, in that sense. From Stefan in a chat saying, if people ask if uh, you're allergic to milk, saying I'm allergic to animal exploitation. So I think that's an interesting one because, but this could spark, to your point, Roger, could spark some conversations from that. How do you most commonly refer to what slash who non-vegans buy? This is an interesting one. So animal products has actually come out on top. And it's interesting. Nobody, nobody's gone for animal ingredients, kind of obviously. I tend to talk about flesh, but then, of course, um, that's if I'm referring to, you know, so-called meat, you know. Uh, but then in terms of, I don't tend to use the word secretions much. I know a lot of, a lot of advocates do that, you know, flesh and, and uh, Christine. I, I never got used to saying that, that for some reason. Yeah, animal products is one that's new for me. Um, only just like the last six months or so, I really started to think, you know, by saying animal product, could we be inferring that other animals are a product? Which I appreciate that's not our intention. However, that could imply this. So to me, and, and I think similar for animal ingredients, you know, we wouldn't want to necessarily suggest that they're an ingredient. Um, so I think some interesting examples around the third option is um, referring to the species. So specifically saying a chicken's wings uh, is a really powerful way to both highlight the individual and articulate that um, 
this is a part of someone's body versus just chicken wings. I don't think anyone really, especially in today's species as culture, I don't think anyone necessarily hones in on, you know, the chicken. Like I generally say animal products, but um, sometimes it might be good to say uh, just literally um, eating animals because just those two words I, I feel can have a kind of trigger on someone who's a non-vegan because because when you're not a vegan, uh, remembering back to when I, I wasn't, you don't think you're eating animals. You, 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 you know, you call it meat, you call it, you know, uh, you call it all these names, but you, you don't kind of think, oh, I'm eating an animal. So if you just say, you know, you could say uh, people who eat animals and then hopefully it might have the same effect as me. To me, I think all these ideas are entangled because it brings us back to our use discussion. Because to me, something I started doing is saying eat or use other animals because I think eating mm. animals in isolation could be a vegetarian message. Oh, or, or, or even as, as uh, Roger said, the word uh, secretions. I kind of like that as well uh, because, yeah, yeah. Uh, so basically uh, you could say people who eat animals and their secretions. I think that would kind of make people think, you know, and uh, secretions, I don't know. It, I think that word has a kind of a, uh, don't you swear, you I, like kind of a gross kind of a Ick horrible factor. sound to it. I'm wondering about whether people thought the secrete. Do people think that uh, quite a lot of people um, wouldn't understand what secretions meant? Or do mm. you think that's an elitist point from me? I think it's it's good to ask people because I know before I was vegan, I like to put myself in those shoes and put on my ears that I would have for that. I, I think I'd probably just write it off because it's something I w haven't really thought about much. I mean, what does that even mean? I think it's only now that I'm vegan, I think about that more. Similar with uh, sentience is another example that I think could be a concept that unless someone's an animal advocate, they might have less exposure to those words. Um, one thing that came up the last time we had our language chat is um, hair versus fur and actually focusing in on, from a, a dismantling speciesism perspective, really using that flip it to test it approach and would we use these same terms for a human animal? Because if we wouldn't, I think we have to really ask ourselves if there's a better alternative. And, and really just, you know, really talking about a pig's skin or a fox's hair, or I think uh, for cows, it's quite challenging because there's so many things that come from them. You know, for like ice cream, for instance, I like to think of um, her as, as her frozen milk, as an example. And, and, and these things might be a bit confusing at first, but if we're in a longer conversation, I think we might be able to unpack some of that with people. I think it's important this point about um, sanitizing the language, you know, and using terms like meat or animal products, because that sanitizes the reality of what's actually happened. And that's why I use words like, you know, animal body parts or the flesh of a um, dismembered body parts of an animal that's been a sentient being that's been tortured to death for no reason and died screaming, because you can actually say it quite quickly. Again, it depends on the context of who you're talking to. I think we kind of want to desanitize, as it were, the way that we talk about these things. We want to create a new sort of um, emotional charge around the reality of what is going on. And, you know, that's, again, why I know that obviously there was no meat in your suggestions. But I think that's why it's important to use alternative terms to, to, get the, to kind of get people mm. to recoil on some level. There's a balance to be drawn here. Um, because um, in general terms, I mean, uh, social movement theorists see social movements as claims makers. And this is why language is so important, which is you know, one of the reasons why we focused on it uh, quite a bit. And um, so language is, is important because we make claims. We identify a problem in society and we make a claim. You know, our, our claim is based on the fact that, you know, society is speciesist and therefore we make claims about that. At the same time, you've got to try to use language which doesn't completely lose people, but it, it does challenge people. So you can't use the same, the, 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 the same kind of language that the, the users use, as it were. You've got, you've got to try and move them on to, to, a, to a new vocabulary. And um, this is, I think this is the reason why jo Joan Denea, um, she had a thesaurus of, um, you know, as it were, don't say this, say that in her book animal uh, animal equality and it, it never took on in the movement and when i reviewed the book i i predicted that it wouldn't because um if you were to use that most people wouldn't really understand what you were saying you know you just come out with with a kind of sentence f full of almost like jargon really
which we might understand as vegans because we'd learnt it amongst ourselves. But in terms of talking to the public, then it would, it would have lost them. And so I think Pamela's right. You know, the context is the entire thing. Donald Watson said that we have to ripen people up, which means we've got to take them out of their comfort zone. But at the same time, you've got to, you've got to do it in a careful way that you don't kind of lose them as well. So you've got to, you've got to do both at the same time. Yeah, animal products. I, feel, I also kind of feel that that kind of reduces them down to a product and it kind of, it doesn't really highlight what has happened to get there. And also if you were to say like human product, you wouldn't assume it's a product that contains humans. You would assume it's a product that's been created by humans. Whereas when you say animal product, you don't mean a product that's been created by those animals because they had absolutely no choice in, you know, what happened. Um, so even if you, if you were just to say products that contain animals, I feel like it at least highlights, you know, a difference between just, you know, a product that, you know, because it wasn't made by animals, it was made by human animals, but I don't think it, I, I think it just, yeah, it's kind of speciesist to me because it means something different than what it, what it actually implies. So then you'd have to say a product that contains other animals. And, you know, yeah. that's, what, that's what I'm saying, you know, are, are we, are we getting to a language which is kind of very tuned into our values, but does it lose people? You know, you've got, you've got that kind of balance. Yeah. How do you most commonly refer to vegans? There's also the level of how active people are that may need to be a factor here too. We're seeing some new options in the chat, vegan advocate, um, people who respect animals. I quite like that one because the animal, animal rights to me, it all comes down to that right to be respected. Uh, vegans um, slash animal activists. Animal, yeah. animal allies is an interesting one. Yeah, animal allies, because, yeah, instead of um, being their voice, uh, you know, standing in solidarity with them. Micah has said, surely it depends on how they identify themselves. I would agree with that. We've also had from uh, Tony and Mike, vegan advocate to me sounds as if we would be advocating for vegans, not the animals. And you could probably say the same for vegan activist. And uh, I would certainly agree with that sentiment. I think it depends if I know, if I know know what they refer to themselves as already. You know, like um, you know, I would always describe um, Ronnie Lee as an animal liberationist, for example. Um, you know, uh, you would you would do that in relation to you know, I would call Peter Singer a utilitarian uh, if if I couldn't think of a swear word. I often I often say vegan animal rights as a, as a phrase. So I suppose you have got vegan animal rightist. Those those things are intertwined as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, it's uh, it kind of uh, concerns me a little bit that a lot of a lot of new ad advocates are kind of suggesting that kind of veganism and animal rights are separate are separate issues. I don't I don't accept that, and I don't think the founders of the vegan social movement would accept that. The written question is: Yesterday, I heard someone say "animal defender," and it sounded wrong to me. What do you think about that? What, what do you think? Should I? I'm happy to have a, a first go at this. I mean, I guess to me to defend someone isn't necessarily what other animals need. They just need us to leave them alone. And I do think there could be some um, potentially welfarist undertones to that, that we're protecting them through fair use. You know, we're into kind of negative utilitarianism now in the sense that uh, leaving them alone is, um, is now being critiqued, you know, from various angles. Um, Mika has one saying, do cupcake vegans identify themselves as cupcake vegans? Personally, I find the label unhelpful as it sends out an elitist message that we're better than them. Um, and the, another question that was earlier on is someone who presented a discussion yesterday on animal resistant social media presentation identified as an animal protector. What are your thoughts on this? And I guess I'd probably put it in a similar camp to the animal defender. Do you have any quick thoughts on that, Roger, or anyone else? Well, if you're going to start using words like that, you know, animal respecter, that would be an interesting one, wouldn't it? Um, because I mean, that's the, the core to the rights space thing that, that we're demanding respect for the rights of other animals. How do you most commonly refer to the movement? Yeah, well, obviously uh, it won't surprise anybody to say that I kind of suggest that I am part of the animal rights movement because that's where I want to focus my talk. So obviously I would use that language kind of straight away. What do you think about that, Roger? Because I know we've had discussions in the past where if it's not a movement based on rights, which I think both of us and maybe others on the call would agree it's not far and wide, should we be referring it to the animal rights movement in the hopes that it will eventually be 
the animal rights movement or should we reserve that term for those who specifically have a rights-based approach and refer to the movement as a whole perhaps as the animal movement option a bit more generic i don't really um agree that we can talk about the existing movement as the animal rights movement because it's not uh, it's, it's like saying peter is an animal rights organization which a lot of people would say but that's not true so um it would um it'd be, it'd be important to um to not kind of uh this is a non-species term no, we shouldn't over over egg that you know we should be more more honest about it so in in terms of the idea of animal rights broadly defined you know which some people use i would tend to say if i'm talking about the whole movement i tend to talk about the animal advocacy movement you know so francione would then say well in that case we've got the animal confusion mo movement because it's it's utterly confused in terms of its philosophical uh, grounding and to to include everything that goes on in the movement from the rspca uh, along to wherever as the animal rights movement is just wrong um but i think like when you say the animal rights movement like we're fighting for animal rights that's what it is and if you even look at feminism like you know there's there's so many um different types of feminism you know there's like first wave feminism second wave feminism there are all these different things and i think they've been going on for so many years and that we are still only in a very early-ish stage of the animal rights movement. So it looks like about half of the votes are in, so I'll give it another 10 or 20 seconds. So feel free to jump, jump in there with your opinion, because I think this is, I know for me, it's something that comes up quite often, often within vegan circles, but I do think it trickles out into our advocacy if we refer to someone's idea as one of the following and, and the implications that may have. And I think with that, we are just about, most people responded, so I'll go ahead and share these results. And it looks like we- How do you most commonly refer to non-vegan ideas? Be curious to hear some people's thoughts on these, both from, um, uh, from a specificity perspective of the word, but also how it could be in, uh, taken by the audience. My quick thoughts on this is I've used justification for the first three years of my like, you know, more full on animal advocacy. And it just occurred to me that by referring to it as a justification, it implies that it justifies the behavior. So I've actually moved towards saying, you know, non-vegan beliefs. You certainly, you certainly are talking about socialized beliefs that um, reflect a culture's values. That's what we're dealing with, really. We have a question. Um, we're all conditioned, but should we be calling someone conditioned brackets directly? Well, it's a fact, isn't it? I, I like to sort of, I think, given what we're saying, I, I talk about, what, generally when I'm speaking to non-vegans, I, I refer to us as a society being conditioned or being um, sort of victims of this, you know, speaking to society rather than the individuals themselves. Um, I find that that's, you know, I don't know if it's most effective, but sort of reduces any chance of me in fine line blaming someone, that I'm trying to shame them, and that this is kind of a, a collective thing that we're all, we're all a part of. But some people, rather than saying condition, they might say brainwashed, which obviously, uh, I mean, that's an interesting phrase. You could probably have an academic seminar on that. But um, really, to a sociologist, that just means socialized, really. I think just the way we frame things, saying you're conditioned is very different than saying I was conditioned or we were conditioned and making it more of a we were tricked versus you've been tricked. I think that really shifts the things to looking at it um, together versus you're conditioned and I'm not. Yeah, we language is good, isn't it? We language is, is interesting in that sense, in advocacy, yeah. What's your favorite new phrase to help dismantle speciesism? How Joan refers to uh, quote unquote aquariums. Aquariums and yeah, they, uh, as aqua prisons. You know, it's, um, I, I always thought that was great. But the point is, the utility of saying that on the street is pretty limited. So we're back to this thing about our job, in a way, is to shake up the culture. And so um, this idea of being disruptive. A political um, philosopher called H Herbert Marcuse, and he talked about the great refusal. So we've got to do that. In terms of the dominant culture, we've got to refuse its values, right? And we, we are going to be part of the of the great refusal. 
because I, I think to me this taps into kind of the fun side of it and you know how can we really be strategic and use these words to get people thinking looks like free living being is the favorite word of the day well I don't know. Animal, animal advocates they still use the word wild or wildlife don't they it's quite interesting you know i i t i've moved away from that a long time ago yeah because it does imply that they are quote unquote wild versus actually they're free living it's it's i think it's an important distinction how do you feel about the fishes or a fish compared to just simply fish well that's one of the things that you get criticized for in the sense that it's not grammatically correct but the point is it's politically correct i just wanted to ask jeremy or roger could you elaborate on what you see the difference between wild and free living because i'm not seeing it myself to me, I think wild implies that there's a derogatory association with them not living in structured homes as humans do. So to me, um, you know, you think about uh, human animals, and if we referred to someone as wild, perhaps it would be in a positive sense, but I think most oftentimes it would imply they're out of control. I agree with that kind of, it's got a slight kind of derogatory kind of uh, element to it, and it would kind of like feed into the kind of etymology of... Um, talking about other animals as beasts and uh, lower animals and this kind of stuff. It's got that kind of thing about it. For me, really, the free living being um, is a much more positive, it just, it's just seems like a much more positive thing to say. I think you're saying more when you, when you talk about a free living being. Um, it's kind of giving them agency, I think. It's an interesting comment point. from Greg. He said, um, as a retired park ranger, the term wildlife has never bothered me. I never thought of wild as negative. Yeah, and I think that's a great point around this, that, you know, we all interpret these words differently. Hmm. So I, I think part of this is also using words that are familiar, but used in a different context. Because I think if, if we say free living, it's more likely to get people thinking than if we refer to other animals who live in nature as wild. I think they might gloss over it quicker. Because we've got free living beings as an alternative to it, I just think that's much more kind of positive. That's, that's all, really. What's your favorite non-speciesist catchphrase? So I think that as gentle as a cow probably has a lot of variations for those of us who have spent time at a sanctuary. Um, thinking of those positive traits that those other animals have got you to think about and, and pinning, you know, as cuddly as a turkey, you know, as uh, fast as a fish, is, uh, as a fish is. And some of those things can really, you know, versus the whole, you know, smells like fish or, you know, fat as a cow and some of those alternative terms and really just trying to, to dismantle that. So it looks like there's some other options coming in through the chat. So feed two burns with one scone. And before a photo is taken, say cashew cheese instead of just cheese. I like that one. I always say, say vegan cheese. I do quite like the it's not my first rodeo protest. And also no. liberate a can of worms. I think if we start working these into our conversation and getting creative with it and having fun, don't put all your avocados in one basket instead of don't put all your eggs in one basket. This whole discussion has been about respectful language. And to me, it would be inconsistent to not extend that to human animals as well. And I think one thing that I know I've be, um, tried to work on being more aware of myself is around ableism. And I'm curious to hear what people's thoughts are on this next poll. Which of the following do you think could be considered ableist? I suppose it's come to the fore a little bit more with the the move towards a pro-intersectional um, approach within uh, the animal movement. And but also, you know, again, I mean, ableism is another deeply kind of culturally difficult thing. I mean, the main thing I say about ableism is the, the people who think it's going to be too PC, um, they often say, oh, well, this is about offense. And this is a misunderstanding of why some people object to ableist language, for example. It's not about offense, it's about harming others. And so the problem of ableist language is not that you're going to offend somebody. It's because you're going to harm somebody. Because, you know, in, in abusive situations, domestic violence and other abusive situations, um, a lot of that is linguistic. So there might be physical violence, but there would be kind of linguistic violence. And so you'll be called names, as it were, during the, the issue or whatever, right? And so those kind of words can really bring that back to people. And so if you try to avoid ableist language 
you're avoiding bringing harm back to someone rather than just avoiding offending people, which I think people often misunderstand why it's, a, it's an issue, I think. To me, like Roger was saying about not harming others, I guess similar with the not risking having welfarist undertones, I guess the question is why risk? You know, why not err on the side of caution versus risk saying something that may harm others? And I think the key is a lot of it's not intentional. It's, it's oftentimes just common language that we say without even thinking about it. And if that's anything throughout this whole session, it's about just being more mindful in general with our language. And you know, in addition to dismantling speciesism and all these things, just having consistent, um, you know, respectful language throughout. The R word here is um, has been quite uh, a feature of the modern day movement in the sense that there are, there are some of the prominent YouTubers who will use that phrase quite a lot. To, to me, the, the most important thing about, um, about ableist language is if in discourse or conversation, somebody actually asks you not to use certain things, certain words, it's usually, in my experience at least, not because they're offended by those words, it's because they're hurt by them. And so I think in particular, although I think we all can drop into ableist language really easy in the same way as that um, if we get heated, you know, we can drop into speciesist language and, you know, the odd it arrives and this kind of stuff. Uh, ableism is even worse because it's more embedded into, into, into our language. But if somebody actually asks you not to, then you should really try to make the effort uh, not to then, I think. I mean, the issue is power. It's about power, isn't it? And how you're sort of like enforcing sort of like power structures and the people that will be sort of like inadvertently calling somebody by one of the terms in your list um, will be sort of um, in a position of privilege and therefore they don't have to think about, you know, the uh, emotional or other impacts, structural impacts that they have on somebody's life by using those kind of words. And they should actually be doing the work. We should all be doing the work to think about the actual words that we're using and the power of the words that we're using. I used to teach the sociology of humor and we used to talk about blonde jokes. And one of the uh, participants in the course said, well, you know, I sometimes say I'm having a blonde day, you know, if I've made a few mistakes or I've done something silly. You know, so, you know, the, these are deeply embedded. You know, that's why, this is why it's important. Language is deeply embedded in our culture. It reflects- And that's simultaneously ableist and Texas, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it reflects our values. Yeah. Yeah, on the topic of, of these terms, in a lot of the reasons why people would give, you know, you know, they'd say, oh, they don't mean anything by saying these terms. And I think it does really come down to understanding that people really don't, often don't understand why the word is hurtful as opposed to offensive. Um, similar to what Roger was saying, like a lot of people think people are just getting offended by things, but the, the hurt is very, very real. And it's like with ableism, the world doesn't really, um, allow people with different abilities a space in existence as it is they're always you know um, denied their reality so then when they go out and they hear people you know using these words jokingly at their friends like saying oh you're an idiot or in Ireland it's really like words like spastic and handicapped are so used just regularly so I had a brother who grew up hearing people he was to say he's disabled and he grew up hearing people using these terms and he was like why is my existence an insult because you know those words are meant to mean just you know to define their um, abilities but they're being used as insults so he grew up um, with an understanding that his very existence was used as an insult so you know what it creates in later life is like a complete um, misunderstanding of where you belong in the world which which people with disabilities already can have because there's very little um, you know space for them as it is so I think it's really important but even me growing up with two family members who have extreme disabilities I even use ableist language it's like so ingrained in everything and you really really have to work on like um checking yourself and making sure that the words you're using aren't literally denying someone's you know existence in the world so yeah I hope you enjoyed this first ever episode of Common Ground I'm so excited for this new format to help us come together to explore new ideas and to try to understand where each of us is coming from when it comes to complex issues facing the movement. At the end of the Zoom discussion, we polled the audience and they said that they'd prefer to explore a pro-intersectional approach and whether human rights and animal rights are related during the next show. So if you think you might be interested in that discussion, be sure to hit that subscribe button and follow the Animal Rights Show on Facebook and Instagram for the latest news. 
Let's keep the conversation going in the comments. Let us know what you think about the language of animal rights, and if there's any words you choose to focus on, or ones you might potentially swerve. We'll see you in the next video, or our live Zoom discussions every Saturday. Thanks for watching.